Hello Year 9, I bet you're happy right now to see Mr Smith's face. You are very, very lucky now that uh, as we are after Easter, as you've been told quite a lot of times, after Easter is when we always start teaching the GCSE to our Year 9s. And uh, my Year 10s have been lucky enough that since school closed, they have been getting videos like this for all of their lessons. Um, and you are in that same position now, Year 9, because now is the time when it's really, really important that you are keeping up with your work because we are starting the GCSE now so you can't afford to get this term behind. So these videos are a way for you to be able to still kind of take part in the lessons without just reading off a PowerPoint. But if you are someone who does like just looking at the PowerPoints, which is fine, um, Miss Corcoran is also providing for all of you PowerPoints with a voiceover on them. So you've got two options. You will do the exact same work whether you go for the videos or whether you go for the PowerPoints, but you've got two options to find what works for you. Um, so these are what I call my living room lessons because they are being filmed straight from my living room. Now, today we're going to do the first of our GCSE lessons, um, but we're also going to do a bit of a walkthrough on some of the kind of processes and how it works on these videos. OK, so what I always do at the beginning is I will tell you what you need to have for this lesson. So. You will need to have your exercise book. Now, I appreciate that some of you weren't able to get these at the end of term. So if that's the case, um, up to you whether you've got a fresh notebook at home, you could do all of your GCC lessons in a notebook, or you could do it on some paper and maybe keep them in a file, but preferably in your books if you've got them. You're gonna need a pen and a ruler. You are going to need your phone. Now, we have found that it's much easier for you to watch these videos on a laptop and then have your phone because there will be certain points when I ask you to scan QR codes on the video okay so it's easier if you've got both in front of you and then there are two sheets that you um, can have for this if you can't print them that's fine we're not expecting everyone to be able to print things um, you will just have to copy the sheets into your books but they're nothing too hardcore um, but if you can print them the two sheets that would be useful are types of retail sheet and the retail location sheet both of which are attached on the email you would have been sent this video on okay so as I say, we are starting our GCSE today. So if you are in your exercise book, I know you've got all of your old year nine stuff in there. So what would be quite a good way to separate the fact that this is the GCSE would be to fold the next page in half. So you've almost got like a divider. And then I want you to write on there, GCSE, topic one, retail. Okay, GCSE, topic one, retail. So. Obviously at this point as well, we are aware that you have all made your options now. Um, but regardless of whether you have chosen to take GCC Geography or not, you are still having geography lessons until the end of the summer term. If you were in school, you would still be having them the whole way through the summer term. So this work still needs to be complete regardless of your options, because it's really important that we are able to give you all a kind of geography experience rather than just those doing GCC geography. But obviously those of you who are doing GCC geography, this is now vital. This stuff that we are doing now can come up in your exams. So it is very, very important that you are following the videos, following the PowerPoints and making notes. OK, so just to give you an outline. So the GCC geography is broken down into three main themes. We have theme one, theme two and theme three. Theme one is your more human geography. Theme two is physical geography and theme three is environmental geography. We are starting off with theme one and we are starting off with the two smaller topics in theme one, which are retail and leisure. So we will be getting both of these units done by the end of the summer term so that when you come back in year 10 and you're in your actual GCC geography groups, you will then finish theme one off. So you will all be in the exact same position, regardless of who your teacher is. But we were starting, as I say, with retail. We're having a look at shopping, something none of us can do right now, apart from online. Um, so here's the kind of spread of what we do throughout the GCSE. So in year nine and 10, we cover retail, leisure, urban, rural, urbanisation, development, and we do some field work. Um, and then in the second half of year 10, we pick up our theme two stuff. As you can see from this, year nine and 10 is where we do the majority of the work. Year 11, we work the first kind of two terms up until just before Easter. Um, but year nine and 10 is where we do the majority of the work. So year nine and 10 is just as, if not more important than the work you do in year 11. So the stuff we are doing now, you need to make sure you are fully understanding it, okay? 
And the other th thing I would like to remind you of is now you're in year nine, um, we would really love if you have a Twitter account or if you would like to start a Twitter account to follow the Downlands Geography page. Because on the Downlands Geography page, we are regularly posting articles, photos, questions that can really help further your geography GCC. So if you get a chance, and I know lots of you are doing lots of time looking at your phones at the moment, please go follow Downland Geography for me and just scroll through it, maybe once a week, just scroll through and see what we've posted this week, all right? Okay, so we are gonna get started with our lesson now. That's all of the waffle at the beginning done. Now, this is something I do at the start of every one of my video lessons, is we do a little bit of a jog your memory to remind you of stuff that you've been doing recently as a little recap. So what we do is stuff that we've kind of been doing. Obviously, it's a bit different at this point in the United. We haven't started the GCC stuff, so we're gonna be doing a bit of background bits. So define sustainability, which of the below are an economic impact, uh, benefit of a hazard, and what is found at the following grid reference, and there is a little image. So what you are gonna do now is I'll let you all to pause the screen, so pause the video, and in a moment, this QR code will come up bigger and I won't be here anymore, and I want you to scan it on your phone. So all you need to do, if you've got a smartphone, open up the camera app, scan the QR code, and it will take you straight through to an online quiz. So this online quiz, you need to put your name in, your full name and a sensible name. We've got all of year nine doing this, so I do want your full name so we can see who you are. Um, and what we use this for is just to keep an eye on which students have actually been kind of engaging properly. So it's a good way for the teachers to be able to keep an eye on who's doing the work and stop us from nagging you all so much. If you can't scan a QR code, there is an Earl at the bottom, which unfortunately you're gonna to have to type that whole thing out for me. So pause your phones now and scan this and have a go. Okay, hopefully you've all had a go at that, so we will get started with our first lesson. So, your title for today's lesson is Changing Patterns of Retail. What I'd like you all to do is write this into your books, underline it with a ruler, please keep your notes neat, okay? And what we're gonna be covering today is we're gonna be having a look at a range of different key terms predominantly today, but we're also gonna have a look at the different types of retail and where you find those different types of retail. So we're gonna have a look at some key terms like catchment, threshold and range, we're going to explain the link between catchment and the price and the type of goods. And then we're going to have a look at the pattern of retail across places. And we're going to have a look at Brighton in particular, because I'm sure you all know lots about Brighton. So title in your books today is Changing Patterns of Retail. Write that in now. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be doing quite a lot of key terms today. And we're going to start off with this key term here, which is when we talk about a range. So I know range is a word that we hear lots of different contexts of generally, but this is a particular type when we talk about the range of a shopping item, the range of a good. So a range is the distance a customer is willing to travel to buy a product. The more expensive the product, the larger the range. If it's a more expensive product, if people are gonna be spending lots of money on that product, they are much more likely and more willing to be able to travel a greater distance to get that product than if it was just a cheap 50p bar of chocolate, all right? So what I would like you to do in a moment is pause your screens and I want you, first of all, to copy out this key term, so write range and the definition, highlight it, because there's lots of key terms and I want these to stand out on your books, and then I want you to write out our five different items here. So we've got a bar of the galaxy, a new car, a DVD, a pair of jeans, and a birthday card. I want you to write out how far in minutes you would be willing to travel to buy each of these five things. Please don't just write A, B, C, D, E. Please write out a bar of galaxy equals and the amount of minutes you would be willing to travel. So pause your screens now, copy the key term, and have a go at this task. Let's talk through these then. So if we were to look at these five, the thing I think I would probably be, and I do love chocolate, by the way. I've got a lot of chocolate. Uh, here's an Easter egg here that I've been making my way through today. Um, what I would like you all, sorry, not what I would like you to do. I distracted myself with the chocolate there. Um, out of these, I think the chocolate is probably the thing that you would be, you would travel the least amount of distance for because it's cheap, 
you know they're generally the same price in every shop you go to, you know what you're buying. So we would say the range for a bar of Galaxy is quite low. I'd probably say the range is maybe 10 minutes. I've got a shop at the end of my road. So for me, it's 30 seconds I've bought to buy a bar of chocolate. Then we'd probably go for a birthday card and um, then a DVD. I'd probably travel, let's see if people even buy DVDs anymore. Who knows, it's all on Netflix, isn't it? Um, but if you're buying a DVD, you might travel a little bit further. You might travel 20 minutes. Um, pair of jeans, you would probably be willing because they're a bit more expensive. You wear them all the time. You wanna make sure you've got the right fit of jeans. You're probably gonna be more likely to travel a bit longer for a pair of jeans, maybe up to kind of 45 minutes. And then a new car, you guys obviously have never bought cars, I assume, but buying a car you're probably going to travel a larger distance you're going to have a wider range to buy that car you might drive up to three hours to be able to find a car because you're spending lots of money on it and you want to make sure that you're buying a decent car so as i say range is the distance a customer is willing to travel generally the cheaper the product the lower the range so when we talk about the different types of product we would say that products are either a convenience good or a comparison good if we were talking about a convenience good, we would be talking about low cost everyday items that you buy on a regular basis. And if we were talking about a comparison good, we're thinking about more expensive things, things that you buy less often, things that you are going to shop around. You're not just gonna buy the first thing you find. So the next thing I'd like to do is pause your videos again in a moment. And I want you to write out these two key terms. So a convenience good is a low cost item that you buy frequently, e.g. And then after the e.g., I want you to write down a couple of examples of things that are convenience goods. And then I want you to do the same for comparison. So write out that key term and then a couple of examples of things that we would say are more comparison goods. So pause your phones now and get on with that. Okay, hopefully you've had a go with that. So if we're talking about convenience goods, we're talking about day to day things. Pint of milk, loaf of bread, things you buy all the time, chocolate. And if we are talking about comparison goods, we're talking about large things. So that's more likely to be your pair of jeans, your car, your TV, things that you're going to shop around for a bit more because you want to make sure you're getting the most for your money. So next key term. Now, I told you it's quite key term heavy today. So the next one is a catchment area. So a catchment area is an area from which a shop gets its customers. So it's Kind of similar, you've probably heard the term catchment phrase when you've talked about schools before. Um, and when you, when you uh, left primary school, when you went on to secondary school, you looked at Downlands' catchment area. And the catchment area is the area from which people travel to get to that school. And it's the same concept with shopping, okay? So small shops that sell cheap items are more likely to have a small catchment area. So a shop that sells day-to-day -day things is not going to have people travelling three hours to get to them. Whereas a large shop that sells more expensive items is gonna have a much larger catchment area. People are gonna travel greater distances to spend money. It's links to what we were talking about with range. You're more likely to travel a greater distance. So the catchment area is going to be larger. So next thing, another key term. I'd like you to write out this key term. Catchment area equals area from which a shop gets its customers. Please keep highlighting these key terms. And then I'd like to write out these two bullet points and finish them off. So small shops selling cheap items have a small catchment area, e.g. shops such as. What kind of shops are going to have a small catchment area? I'm not asking what kind of goods, what kind of items, I'm asking what kind of shops. And then a large shop that sells expensive items is going to have a much larger catchment area. What kind of shops are going to have a much larger catchment area? So pause your phones again, your videos, and complete these for me. Okay, so the shops, the smaller shops that are going to have a smaller catchment area would be things like news agents, supermarkets, um, off licenses, they're gonna have quite a small catchment area. And the larger shops that are gonna have a larger catchment area are gonna be things like car shops or electronic shops or furniture shops. People are gonna travel greater distances to get to these. So we're gonna look at a few examples now. So here is a, a map of Brighton. Um, and we've got three different types of shop here. Sorry, it's fell off the screen. I don't know why that's happened. So our top left one is the catchment area for Debenhams, who have gone into liquidation today. So no more Debenhams after this. Um, but Debenhams, a fairly large department store. They sell a range of clothes, a range of cosmetics, furniture, homeware. They are going to have quite a medium sized catchment. It's not going to have a small one. People do travel some distance for it. We would say the catchment area of Debenhams is probably the whole of Brighton and a little bit further than that, maybe some of the surrounding villages. Um, 
If we were to look at somewhere that had a smaller catchment area, such as a newsagent, we can see here a newsagent has got a very small catchment area. It's only going to have the kind of surrounding streets because there is a newsagent in Brighton, probably every five or six streets you find another newsagent, another corner shop. So people are going to just travel to the one that's closest to them. Where I live, I live quite central Brighton, and I've probably got the choice of one, two, three, four, five corner shops to me. I am always going to go to the one that is closest, the one that's 30 seconds away at the end of my road. I'm not going to go to the one that's two minutes away. People will travel to the one that is closest to where they live. And then we have a shop like Ikea. So Ikea, obviously, there are not that many of them. I think there's about 11 Ikeas in the whole of the UK. So lots of people are going to have a much wider catchment area. There's going to be a wider catchment area for people to go somewhere like Ikea. So what I would like you to do is pause your phones in a moment and I would like you to copy out these three sentences um, telling me the catchment area of these three different types of shops. So describing how large it is. So pause your phones and have a go at that now for me. Okay, so let's talk through these briefly then. So our first one, our news agent, is going to have a very small catchment area, often just a few streets. It's not going to be very big, very small. Debenhams or a large chain store is going to ch chain store. Sorry, I get my words in a tangle. You'll learn that very quickly. Has a medium sized catchment area, so it's much larger than the super, uh, than the news agent, um, but probably not as big as our next one. Um, normally covering a whole city and occasionally some surrounding villages, surrounding suburbs. So you guys in Hassox are, let's put it in your terms. Let's take away Debenhams. Let's think about H and M. You guys in Hassox are quite likely to travel down to Brighton to come to H&M. You're within the catchment area of H&M. But if there was a large H&M in, say, Burgess Hill, you probably wouldn't come to the Brighton one. You'd go to the Burgess Hill one. So the villages and the suburbs kind of depend on where their nearest one is. I'm never living in Brighton going to go to Burgess Hill H&M, though. I'm going to go to the one nearest to me. So it kind of the ones that have a more medium range catchment area are shops, which there are more of them, but there's not loads. You haven't got H&M in Hassocks. They're not on every corner. You are going to have to travel a bit for them. And our last one, Ikea, has got a very large catchment area as there are not many stores. There are not many Ikeas. So the Croydon Ikea, which is up here, is used by the entire southeast of the UK of England because this whole area there is one this way in Southampton and there is one this way up in Essex but this one in Croydon is the nearest one for this whole area of the southeast of England. Now I am one to say that I absolutely love a Saturday a Saturday day out up to Ikea. It takes about an hour and a half to drive there but that don't stop me because I love going to Ikea okay so some shops are going to have really really large catchment areas. So the next thing we're going to have a look at is how to measure a catchment area. So I'm just going to talk you through it. I'm not going to have a go at this. And this is the kind of thing that could come up in an exam question. And when measuring a catchment area, it's the exact same concept as measuring the area. So measuring an area of a place. So what you would need to do is if we were going to be um, measuring the catchment area of an IKEA in Bolton, what we would do is we would measure. So if we would say that this red area is the catchment area, we would measure the length and the width of it and we would times them together to get the area and that would tell us how to calculate our catchment area. So we're moving on now, not so many key terms, and we're going to have a think about the location, so where different types of shop are found in different parts of cities. So what you should have, this is on that sheet if you wanted to print it out and do it directly on the sheet or you can just copy this table out. But I've broken it down into three different areas of retail, three different types of shopping play, uh, experience. So we have a CBD, which is the central business district, the very centre of a town centre. So in Brighton, it's down here, we can see is our CBD. So this is our Churchill Square, our lanes, our area in the very centre of the city. Then we would have our suburbs, our residential areas. So these are those little clusters of corner shops, these little uh, streets where you've got three or four shops maybe. These are suburban high streets. We would probably also consider somewhere like London Road to be a suburban high street because it's not in the CBD, but it's got a collection of shops. But you can see these are fairly spread out. You have them all over the city. 
And then our last one is out of town developments on the edge of towns and cities. So these are these large scale retail parks that you find on the edge of towns and cities. So Hollingbury Astor would be an example of one. The Homebush Centre in Shoreham. The Marina we would probably class as an out of town retail. Now these, there are a few of them generally, but they're generally found on the edge of cities. So what I want you to do is match up the type of retail to kind of what the retail looks like, okay? And what you'll see is on your thing it says A, B and C, and you can match up on your diagrams to see where our A, Bs and Cs are. So pause your screens now and do this match up. Hopefully you've had a go at that. We'll very quickly go through the answers now. So CBDs are shopping malls and large high streets. Our suburbs are small convenience stores and out of town developments are retail parks with a few large stores. So these are our main different types of retail that we will think about. So here are three examples. So here's Churchill Square, our shopping mall. Here is our out of town retail park. This is the uh, Asda Hollingbury. We've got Matalan, we've got Brantano, M&S and Argos, and then Asda's up here. And then our kind of suburban convenience stores, this is Ladies Mile High Street in Patcham, if any of you have ever been there. They've got Domino's, they've got a pharmacy, they've got a few um, corner shops. That's what we would expect to find on these kind of suburban high streets, okay? So what I want us to have a think about is what are the good and bad things about um, these three different types of shopping. So what I would like you to do is in your books, I'm going to do three little mind maps, CBD, shopping malls and retail parks. And then on this screen are a range of different factors, good and bad, good and bad about these different types of retail. And what I'd like you to do is match up the correct ones to the correct type of retail. So you can see that three have already been done for you. So in a CBD, they have expensive rent. So it costs a lot for the shops to be able to have their shop in that area, which means you have very few independent stores. You tend to only find chain shops. Um, shopping malls are often very busy, very congested. There's lots of people there and retail parks. Um, they're difficult to get to if you haven't got a car. So pause your phones, your screens now and do these three mind maps and match up the correct statements. You might find that one or two go on more than one of our retail sites, okay? okay? Let's very quickly go through these. So I think we're starting with our CBD high street. So we've already got rents extensive, but we could say they've got easy access by public transport. Um, in both our CBD and our shopping malls, we would say that parking is difficult, it's expensive. Parking in Brighton is obscene, and I know I live in Brighton, so I shouldn't be lazy and drive. But if I want to go to Churchill Square, it's going to cost me seven or eight quid to park there for a couple of hours, which is stupid money. Our shopping malls, um, they're easy to shop in all weather, so you can go on a rainy day. Um, and they normally have easy access. They're normally very flat surfaces, they have lifts, so they're very good for maybe disabled people or mothers who have prams. And then that means our retail park, we've already said it's difficult to get to if you haven't got a car. They'll often have other leisure activities. So like the marina, they've got cinemas, they've got um, restaurants, there's bowling. We've also got some large shops there. Um, oh, where's it gone? And they often have more space to develop. Because they're on the edge of town, they can get bigger. Whereas a mall in the middle of a city, it's very hard for them to grow and get larger because there's already a whole city around them. Um, and they often have free parking as well in your retail parks. You can drive there for free. Okay, two more key terms to go. So, a threshold. So, a threshold is the minimum population size needed to support the retail outlet, i.e. have enough customers to make money. So, it's the minimum number of people that need to go in and out of that shop each day and buy some products in order for that shop to continue making profit and continue to stay open. When a shop is consistently below its threshold, that's when it will then close down. It's not making enough money to be able to pay for its rent and to be able to pay to stay open. So what I'd like to do is copy this key term out and answer these two questions. So what type of shops have a low threshold and what type of shop have a large threshold? So what shops need lots of people going into them in order to make money and what shops don't need as many people? So again, think about the cost of the product people are buying. So shops that are likely to have a low threshold population are shops that sell expensive items. So shops that sell furniture, shops that sell cars. 
Because these items are expensive, they don't have to sell that many a day to be able to make enough money to stay open. They might only have to sell three cars a day, maybe, I don't know, I've no idea, in order to make enough money for them to stay open. Whereas shops that have a large threshold are things like supermarkets, things like corner shops, things like stationery shops, because these are all cheaper items. They need to sell a lot of these items in order to be able to make enough money to stay open. So they have a larger threshold than say a car shop would. So what I want us to do now is bring all of this together. So you've got this sheet as well if you want, or you might have to copy it out if you can't print it. Uh, and what we've got are our three different types of shops. So we have retail, uh, convenience stores, we have shopping centres or malls, and we have retail parks. And what I would like you to do is go through and first of all say what location, where would you find them in the town? Then um, what kind of shops do they have? Do they have comparison? Do they have convenience? Are they mainly chain, stop, chain shops or are they independent? And then I want you to go through the catchment area and the threshold population. Do they have a large catchment? Do they have a small catchment? Do they have a large threshold? Do they have a small threshold? And then I want you to think about some of the reasons why. M why might they have a large threshold? Why might they have a small catchment? Okay, so take five or six minutes on this. I've already done some to kind of get you started, but I want you to fill in and make sure you have something in each box for me. Okay. All right, let's go through the answers now. So, convenience stores, like you would find on a suburban high street, they generally sell convenience goods and they're independent shops. You would very rarely find chain shops. Um, they have a small catchment and a large threshold. Um, reasons for this is because they have cheaper rent because they're on the edge of cities, which means independent stores are able to open up in them. And, but it means they have cheaper goods, which means they have a large threshold. They have to have a lot of people going in and out to buy these cheap goods for them to make money. Shopping centres and malls you would find generally in the CBD, near to public transport links, so near to train stations, near to bus stations. Um, they generally sell comparison goods and they're normally chain stores. You very rarely will find independent shops in the CBD. They've got a medium catchment, a medium threshold. Um, they have people coming some distance, but not a huge distance. Um, and they have to sell a fairly high amount of goods, but they don't have to sell as many as, say, a convenience store that's selling things for a couple of quid. Um, and this is because they have expensive rent. So they do have to sell quite a lot because it's going to cost a lot to have a shop in Churchill Square, for example which means only the large chain stores can afford it. And even still, large chain stores, as we know, are often closing down on the high street. So they have to sell a lot of items in order to make money. And then our retail parks are out of town on the edge. Um, they normally sell a mixture of comparison and convenience. Think of Holland Asda. We've got Asda, which mainly sells convenience, but then we've got um, Brantano and we've got Argos, which sell more comparison goods, things that you're gonna shop around for. And they will generally always be chain stores. And they normally have quite a large catchment, so people travel quite large distances to get there, but they can often have quite a small threshold. And they have a small threshold because, um, because they often sell more specialist goods, because they've got a large retail space. They've got big, big buildings, which means that um, they're able to sell kind of more specialist, larger goods, and people are gonna take more time to go and look around. Um, but it means that they don't often have to sell as many. These large retail spaces will probably be cheaper than the smaller ones in the town centre. It's cheaper for them to rent these, these spaces than it would be in the town centres, which is why you'll often find some chain shops only ever on retail parks. You don't often find them in city centres, okay? Right, we're nearly done now. So our next key term, and our last one, is footfall. So footfall is the number of people that walk past or travel past a shop. So the footfall will determine how many kind of people go into that shop, how many people are gonna be buying things, and will help a shop work out how high or low their threshold is. So for example, Budgeons in Hassocks is gonna have a much lower footfall than M&S in Brighton. There are many more people walking past the M&S in central Brighton, I know that's London, um, than there would be um, walking past Budgeons, all right? So what I'd like to do is copy out this key term and just these two little yellow boxes for me as well. So determine what a high footfall and a low footfall is. We are nearly there now, you've done brilliantly, okay? So copy this out, off we go. Okay, 
last thing I want you to do is we're going to tie all of this together a bit now and we are going to have a think about an exam question, all right? So the question is, new retail outlets can often be controversial, e.g. the new IKEA in Lansing. Explain the conflict, conflicting views locals may have on an IKEA at this site. So we've got a bit of information here. We've got the new site there. It's on the edge of the countryside. Um, it's right next to a main road. Uh, and this is what they think it will look like when it's finished. I personally can't wait for this IKEA to open, but I know lots of people are very against it. So I'm gonna go through with you now how we might structure this answer, okay? Because a six mark question, these are your P snowballs. So if it is explain the conflicting views, we know that we are going to make two points. But each of these points are gonna be fully elaborated. So you might wanna draw something else like, something like this down in your margin so you can really clearly see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the points, or you can think of your own, obviously, and then I want you to have a go at elaborating them. So they need to be conflicting views, which means they need to maybe have different groups of people. They need to be views that maybe one is positive, one is negative. So we could say environmentalists would dispute the destruction of countryside. Aren't you glad you still get to read my terrible handwriting? Okay, this means that. So what would be a problem of the destruction of countryside? This means that, so give enough, then I want you to give me one of your reasons, resulting in, and I want you then to elaborate it again. So we've taken this point and we have fully snowballed it. But then we need to do our opposing point. So we could do something like consumers would support the new IKEA due to reducing travel times. Okay, then you need to do exactly the same. You need to explain it with a this means that resulting in. So, so you've again fully elaborated that point. So I've given you two points here, two conflicting views, and I want you to have a go at fully explaining, at elaborating those points, okay? So I'm going to pause the screen so you've got the question big for you. Remember this structure, maybe make a copy of it in your books before you go on to having just this on the board, all right? And off you go. Well done, Year 9. You have survived your first living room lesson. Hopefully, you found this useful and hopefully this is going to be a better way for you to learn the GCC throughout the next term. Um, if you do have any questions, please email me or email your geography teacher. I'm more than happy to help. But at the end of the lesson, what I like to do is just a quick rundown of what you should have in your book by the end of the lesson. So you should have the following key terms and examples. So range, type of good, catchment area, threshold and footfall. These are your five main key terms that we have learned today. You should have a catchment area description. So the descriptions of those three different shops, so Debenhams, Ikea, etc. You should have the types of retail sheets. So the three different types of shop matched up to where you would expect to find them. And um, the features of retail locations mind maps. So there's three little mind maps with the different features of our different retail locations. You should have the retail locations sheet, um, which was that big grid where you went through our three different retail locations and told me about the location, the catchment size, the goods, etc. And then you should have had a go at this six mark question. Now, I know this might have felt like quite a lot today, but please remember the first five minutes was me waffling about how these videos are going to work. All right. But well done, you nine. I hope you're all doing well. Please stay in touch. And you lot are brilliant.